You are now listening to a message from Eka Christian Center. Get set to be at the fire. God has blessed you. Unto his disciples from the law of Moses, that's the writings of Moses, from the prophets, and from the Psalms, the things concerning himself. So we see clearly that the salvation message comes from the Old Testament. We see clearly that the kingdom message comes from the Old Testament. We see clearly that every single New Testament doctrine is derived from the Old Testament scriptures. Hallelujah. So there is no such thing as saying, oh, that is the Old Testament. Mm -mm. The Old Testament is not in the part of the Bible. The Old Testament is in the Revelation. The Old Testament is in the relationship. So, for example, Genesis is not Old Testament. Are you following what I'm saying? Genesis is in the Old Testament section of the Bible. You must know the difference between the Old Testament being the Old Testament in covenant relationship and the Old Testament in the Old Testament section of the Bible. You must also note that Old Testament and New Testament, in, as, um, as, a, as a language used to differentiate the Bible into two parts, is not inspired, which means that God did not make that classification. That classification was made by men for ease of reference so that we could easily find, you know, the, the, the scriptures that is being referred to. I mean, if you understand what I'm saying. So, actually, the Bible is not really divided into Old Testament and New Testament. The Bible is just the Bible. Praise God. I said, praise God. The Bible is just the Bible. Now, let me remind, because there are some folks that are not, in, this midweek, in this series for the first time, why exactly are we looking at the law and the prophet? What's the point of this series. The point of this series is to show to you the sanctity of the scriptures and for you to see also that the Bible or the scriptures is inspired in all, whether it is in the Old Testament section of the Bible or is in the New Testament of the Bible. The Bible is God's word in full, without exceptions. The Bible is God's word, in, word, word, God's word in full without exceptions. There is no better part and there is no inferior part. Every single part of the Bible is God-inspired. Say this with me. Every single part of the scriptures is inspired. Say it again. Every single part of the scriptures is inspired. Very, very important. Very, very important. Inspiration is plenary. That means inspiration of the scriptures is in full. There is no uninspired part of the scripture and there is no useless part of the scripture. Praise the Lord. All right? It's also for us to understand that Moses is not against Jesus. Neither is Elijah against Jesus. Neither is Ezekiel against Jesus. There is no Paul versus Jesus in scripture. Glory to God. Moses testifies of Jesus, Ezekiel testifies of Jesus, Elijah testifies of Jesus, which means all of the prophets and all of the writers of the scriptures give witness to Jesus. There is no Jesus versus any Bible writer. Are you following what I'm talking about? So there is no need to pit them against Christ, so what you understand, and things like that. No, all scripture points to Jesus. Now let's continue our teaching and look at Romans chapter number 16. Romans chapter 16, where we're going to be looking at our theme scriptures. Praise God. Hallelujah. Romans 16. Let's look at verse 25 to 26. He says here, listen, he said, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Are you seeing that? According to the what? Revelation of the mystery. Now listen. The Old Testament scriptures, the Old Testament writings are called and referred to as the mystery. Why is it called the mystery? It is called the mystery because the plan of God for salvation was recorded in the Old Testament scriptures, but that plan was concealed. 
Are you following? So when you read it, except the Spirit of God opened your eyes to see, you couldn't readily see what that land was. So Paul refers to the plan of salvation as recorded in the Old Testament as the mystery. Everybody say the mystery. All right. Now let's continue reading. All right. It says the mystery. All right. According to the revelation of the mystery. So hold on. The Old Testament is referred to as the mystery, but the New Testament writings or the epistles are referred to as the revelation of the mystery. Old Testament is referred to as the mystery. The New Testament writings are referred to the revelation of the mystery. So in the Old Testament, the Messiah is referred to, but we did not know who the Messiah was from the Old Testament because that person called the Messiah the Christ, we had not yet. In the New Testament, we clearly see who the Messiah is. The Messiah is Jesus Christ. So the mystery that was referred to in the Old Testament, there is a revelation of that mystery in the New. Do you understand what I'm saying? Church, do you understand what I'm saying? So, Old Testament has the mystery. The New Testament has the what? Revelation of the mystery. Can you say it with me? Old Testament has the mystery. The New Testament has the revelation of the mystery. So, that means Christ is in the Old Testament concealed mystery. And it's in the New Testament what? Revealed. Revelation of the mystery. So, when you are reading the Old Testament, you are reading Christ concealed. When you are reading the New Testament, you are reading Christ's word revealed. Come on, do we get that? All right. Now, let's continue reading. All right, what it says. It now says, which was kept secret since the foundation the world began. 26 now says, but now is made manifest. And, listen, it's made manifest. And by the scriptures of the, by the scriptures of the, so, it is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets. So, what does Paul use, which scriptures does he use to make manifest the mysteries in the Old Testament? Which scripture does he use? Which scripture does he use? What scripture does he use? So, he uses the Old Testament to reveal Christ from the Old Testament. Are you following? Are you following? So, the answer of the New Testament is derived from what? The Old Testament. So, the New Testament is actually the Old Testament properly explained. The New Testament section of the Bible is the Old Testament properly explained. All right? Because in the New Testament, there are no mysteries. The mystery is decoded. There is no mystery. The mystery is unveiled. Christ is that unveiling. Christ is the mystery, all right, that is unveiled. Glory to God. He said, all right, but now it's made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Praise God. Now look at St. Mark's Gospel, chapter number one. Hmm. Mark 1 and verse 1 says, in the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, listen, he said, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, verse 2, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now notice, Mark is writing the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he makes a reference to the prophecy of Isaiah concerning John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. So you see that to speak to New Testament realities, the writers of the New Testament make Old Testament references. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Now look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Why is this important? <laughs> Listen to me. The foundation of the believer, the foundation of a Christian, must be knowledge of the Scriptures. Where ignorance of the Scriptures is tolerated, abuse is inevitable. Where ignorance of the Scriptures is tolerated, you will have people tossed to and fro. Okay? Praise God. <laughs> where ignorance of the Scriptures exists, your hair head will be shaved. So I was seeing some interesting conversations, you know, online. I think somebody was saying, now, um, sometimes some people can take a position that is wrong, not, not because they are, they are bad people or anything. No, it's just sometimes it happens. So I see, I, see, I see in a conversation where someone was talking about how that Elijah, 
all right? Elijah was, you know, when Elijah was translated, that Elijah didn't go to heaven, even though the scripture says Elijah went to heaven, that Elijah was cut up from one place and taken to another place, all right? Now, and the reason this person was saying that that happened was because in the book of Second Chronicles, there was a letter from Elijah to Jehoram, the king of Judah. Praise God. I said, praise God. And the person built a wonderful position based on that. And I looked at her like, hmm, you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I was like, hmm, you know. So knowledge is very important. Bible knowledge that is. And you may say, but pastor, how does that affect anything? Look at me. Let me just dish you. The religious consciousness of a nation determines the fabric of that nation. Did you hear what I said? The religious consciousness of a nation determines the fabric of that nation. It determines the morality of that nation. So, um, if you take the knowledge of God out of the socialization of a territory, what is going to happen is that laws will be passed, activities will go on in that nation that is devoid of any sort of humanity. So, one of the things the devil always tries to do in a particular nation is to take the consciousness of God out. So, for example, one perfect place for you to see that is in the West. So, you see, the West, what have they done? They've taken the consciousness of God out. They've taken the teaching of God's word out of their schools. All right, Jesus, God, all those things is taken out. So, what has happened? Abortion is pushed as being legal. So, the infant or the fetus is not seen as something that is alive. Are you following what I'm saying? So you now find that abortion is legal. They can just kill the baby and just move on as nothing is going on. Now it's not male and female. They are bringing in all sorts of, you know, different variants. Why? The consciousness of God is taken out. You see, the consciousness of God is the true knot where which we draw our, you know, our navigation from. That consciousness of God. Even a person may not believe in God, may not believe in Jesus, but if there is a consciousness of God, if there is a consciousness of the divine, it is supposed to bring about regulation to your behavior and regulation to your choices. But if you take out God, you take out, you know, heaven, take out hell, you take out, you know, good, take out bad, and everything is about what is legal and what is not legal, what we agree to be legal and what we don't agree to be, you know, legal, then, you know, Praise God. Amen. You can defend the indefensible. You can just decide to go and bomb some children somewhere, bomb a territory, kill like 2,000 people, and you call it collateral damage. Because when, if the life of a, if the fetus is not seen as a human being, then, you know, those who are human beings can be viewed as cattle. You've taken the consciousness of God out. So the conscience can be, you know, can be deadened, weakened, and all that. So maybe we don't realize that that's what happens. So when we talk about and speak against um, um, territories and countries where there is a high consciousness of God, high Christian activity, the truth about it is this. No matter how bad it is in a place where they go to church, they, go to, they have a semblance of religiosity, no matter how bad it is, believe me, if you take that consciousness of God out, it will be worse. You, it will be worse. Glory to God. And there are some people that celebrate the West. And look at the West as though, you know, this is, I'm a student of history. I still study, I study a lot of history. I read my Bible and I read love history. If I tell you the atrocities of the West, <laughs> if I told you, if I told you the atrocities of the West, if I told, tell you what the West are doing to ensure Nigeria remains the way it is, Africa remains the way it is, if I show you about the atrocities of the West, the Middle East, What's going on in Ukraine? You think Ukraine is the one? It's, it's, it's the places you think they are developed. We should be like them. No, we, you don't know who you are pointing to. If you knew, you will puke. Glory to God. You will puke. Hallelujah. They will slaughter people in a the territory. Then we lose it to a news, a sound bite. They will say it was a misfiring of a cannon or something. <laughs> you understand? Listen, we retain knowledge. So why do we teach God's word? For you to have a proper understanding of God's nature, for you to have a proper understanding of your nature in Christ Jesus, and for you to be a believer that can stand the test of time. 
Because circumstances and situations will come, will happen. Winds and storms will blow to try to shake you to your very foundations. If you don't have the knowledge of God in your spirit, if the knowledge of God has not taken proper root in your soul, you will fall like a pack of cards. Hallelujah. That's why we don't come to treat you human philosophy and try to teach you seven steps to, you know, be your next best self. No. We teach you the word. Because when the devil comes to tempt, he will come for the word that is in you. Now, Second Peter chapter 1 verse 20, it says what? Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture. Now, you know we are talking about law and, the pro- law and prophets, right? Right? Now, it says no prophecy of the scripture is of any what? Private what? So that means no prophetic writings, the words of the prophets, did not come from their minds. Are you following what I'm saying? So when you are reading the prophecies of Ezekiel, and you are reading the prophecies of Isaiah, do not think you are reading a natural writing. Mm -mm. It is God-inspired. Look at the next verse. He says, verse 21, he says what? For... The prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Can you see that? But holy men of God spake as they were what? They spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. They were induced by the Holy Ghost to speak. They spake as they were moved by the Spirit. So that's not what you're reading. It's not the words of man. They're reading words inspired by the Spirit. That's what you're reading. Praise God. I said, praise God. Let's look at another same scripture we have for this series. We have 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16. I just want to go through it. Then we now, you know, proceed. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16, what does it say? It says what? All right. As also, all right, in all his epistles, speaking, is Peter is referring to Paul, speaking in them of these things in which are some things are to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own description. So, Peter tells us that the writings of Paul are what? Scripture. Praise God. Just as the Old Testament writings are also Scripture. Praise God. Now, it's very important to understand the law and the prophets, the writings of Moses and the books of the prophets, they give witness to Christ. So, when you are reading Genesis to Malachi, understand that what you are reading is giving witness to Christ. You can read Genesis to Malachi and see Christ from Genesis, first page of Genesis, to the last page of Malachi. Because the Genesis to Malachi has a witness for Christ. Praise God. Look at Acts 28, 23. When Paul preached the gospel and wanted to preach Christ, he didn't use Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was not written at the time. What he did was that he quoted from Genesis to Malachi. Look at it. Acts 28, 23. He says, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God. Persuading them concerning Jesus. Persuading them concerning who? Uh huh. Both out of what? The law of Moses and out of what? So, out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from what? Morning till. What is the sign that you were a good Bible student? You should be able to hold someone's attention from morning to evening. Unveiling Christ from Genesis to Malachi. From what? Morning to evening. Glory to God. Let's look at another scripture. Look at Romans chapter 3 and verse 21. Are you learning something? Romans chapter number 3 and 21. When someone comes and says, oh, this one, um, Moses did not see where. Ezekiel did not see where. He will see God in Christ alone. Mm -mm, No. Moses gave witness of Jesus. Ezekiel gave witness to Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? All right? The law and the prophets witness Jesus. They are the word of God. They are inspired. Romans 3.21. Can we read one to go? It says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is what? 
manifested. Being witnessed by? Being witnessed by? The word witness here is material. Material means to give evidence. To give evidence. So if you were looking for evidence that Jesus is the Christ, you go to the law and the prophets, you'll find it there. If you are looking for evidence concerning the definition of the righteousness of God, go to the law and the prophets, you find it there. Because you can, it is from the law and the prophets you find out that God does not declare men righteous by the law of Moses. Because he declares Abraham without the law of Moses. He declared Abraham righteous without the law of Moses, praise God. He declared Isaac righteous without the law of Moses. He declared Moses righteous without the law of Moses, praise God. Amen. He declares Rahab righteous without the law of Moses. Because Rahab came to God by faith and she was justified, praise God. And she was a harlot, praise God. And to even show that God justified her by faith and her allotry past did not matter anymore, she is a natural uh, progenitor of Jesus Christ. Amen. And for God to show that salvation was not by being a Jew, praise God, or being a Gentile, but salvation was by faith, Ruth, who was a Gentile, is a natural progenitor of Jesus. She's the grandmother of David. Hallelujah. So from the law and the prophets, you see that the righteousness of God is not by the works of the law, but by what? The hearing of faith. The reason why the nation of Israel did not enter into the promised land was not because they didn't keep the law of Moses. The reason why they didn't enter the promised land was because they did not believe. So that means they did not heed to the hearing of faith. Are you hear what I'm telling you? All that we see from the law and the prophets. Praise God. I said, praise God. So we've said the law and the prophets. Now let us look at the law. All right? The law. What is the law? All right? The law of Moses. Why was it given? What does it, what is the purpose of the law? <laughs> For someone to say, ah, um, um, I've heard some people say stuff like, uh, we don't give tithes. This is the New Testament. Tithes is Old Testament. I've even heard people say stuff like that. Come on, I've even heard people say it now. We don't give tithes. And the reason why we don't give tithes is that tithes is New Testament. Tithes is what? Old Testament. And this is what? <laughs> New Testament. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Nobody's answering now because we want to enter money. <laughs> well, well, first of all, the first time a man gave tithe, there was no Old Testament. Because according to Hebrews chapter number 8, 8 to 9, the Old Testament began in the day the children of Israel left Egypt. And the first man recorded in the Bible to have tithed was who? Abraham. So, Titan had nothing initially to do with the law of Moses. In fact, Titan was co-opted into the law of Moses as a law. But it had always been in existence. Titan belongs in the honor principle. Because Moses tithed to Melchizedek because Melchizedek was a spiritual personality. He was a priest, a high priest. So Moses honored the grace of God on Melchizedek's life by giving him a tithe. So before the law of Moses, tithing belonged to, is what they did to show honor. That was what tithing was about. Hallelujah. So it had nothing to do with old covenant or new covenant. But... In the law of Moses, Titan was now made a law. In the law of Moses. Praise the Lord. So, Abraham, as a Gentile, tithed without a law. Then the Jews, with the law, also what? Titan. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. Jacob, tithed. You know that he tithed? A man, the Bible lets us know that he vowed that, Lord, if you will bless me, I will give a tenth of all I owe. So it was something that was known that they gave a tenth as a 
mark of honor to God. That was what it's like the first fruit. Out of ten, I honor you with one. It was about honor. So in in before the law of Moses, giving was actually a spiritual thing that was done to honor a spiritual being. That's God. Praise the Lord. And that is what giving is about today. So it is not about tight or not to tight, it is about honor. Giving is about honor. So you have a lot of people who are saying, I'm not under the law. I don't tithe. I'm like, hey, bro. Abraham didn't tithe because he was under one law. He did it as a mark of honor. Glory to God. And if you don't give, you're out of line. It means you don't honor God and you don't acknowledge him as the source of all that you own and all that you have. Praise the Lord. You see how that, that is? Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Now, so what's the law of Moses? The law of Moses refers to the first five books. So, you know, the law of Moses is compound. So, the first five books does not have Moses' laws. But when you see um, in Scripture where it says, and beginning at Moses, it's like in St. Luke's Gospel 24, 27, it's talking about the first five books. But now, what I want to talk to you about is about the law of Moses. That is the law Moses gave. Praise God. I said, praise God. So the question is this. Hallelujah. The question is this. Why was the law of Moses given? Are we still under the law of Moses? Well, the answer to, are we still under the law of Moses, obviously, is no. Because the law of Moses was not given to Gentiles. The law of Moses was given to a specific group of people. And it was the Jews. Look at Romans chapter number 2. Praise God. I said, praise God. Romans 2.13. Blessed are ye. Blessed are ye. <laughs> okay, no, I want to say Romans 3.19. Romans 3.19, what does it say? It says what? Now we know that what things soever the law said, he said to them, who are what? Uh -huh. Are you under the law? No. He said to them who are under the law, that every mouth, now notice, purpose of the law, that every mouth may be what? Uh-huh. And all the world may become what? Guilty before God. So the law of Moses was not given to justify anybody. The law of Moses was given as a mirror to men to know who they really were, sinners. The law of Moses was given to men so that men could realize and see how God saw them in their rebellion. They were sinners. So it says, all right, that all the world may become guilty before God. Hallelujah. Look at Romans chapter 9. Romans 9 and verse 3. Romans 9, 3 to 4. Look at what it says. Romans 9, 3 to 4. Look at what it says. It says, for I wish, I could wish that myself were caused from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to flesh. Verse 4, can we read everybody want to go? He says what? Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenant and the word giving of the law. So God did not give the law of Moses to the whole world. God gave the law of Moses to who? The Jews. Hallelujah. I said Hallelujah. He gave the law of Moses to the Jews. <laughs> to the Jews. Now, why did he give the law of Moses? The first reason God gave the law of Moses was to reveal sin. Now, <laughs> praise God. One of my, my, my prodigies came to me one time and said, oh, pastor, I went for evangelism. I said, okay, what happened? So he said, as I went for evangelism, the person I went to preach to was saying, claiming that, that, you know, that he is good. You understand? That is good. That, ah, you are saying I need salvation. He said, no, I'm not a sinner. Don't look at me like I'm good. I'm a good man. I'm better than many of you Christians. You understand? I'm better than many of you Christians. What do you mean? I'm a, I'm a good man. So he now said, Pastor, I didn't know what to do when he said that. Ah. I returned. I said, you, you use the law, baby. You use the law. 
you use the law because that is the purpose of the law. What the law of Moses was to do was to bring you to the end of yourself. I'll give you an example. Remember when Jesus Christ met that guy, the rich man? Remember the rich man that came to Jesus and he said, Lord, what must I do to gain eternal life and enter the kingdom of God? You know, Jesus said, just say, yeah, yeah, you know what the Lord says, you know, love the Lord your heart. Lord, love your God with all your heart and your heart. And love your neighbor as yourself, you know. So Jesus, you know, gave him the, you know, the normal stuff, you know. Give him the normal stuff. Like, you know, if you're a medical student or you're a science student and stuff, you have one JJC that comes in and want to show that the person, I'm, I'm intelligent. You know, you ask one question and the person is showing themselves. The person is now countering in class. You're not saying, eh, you know I'll be, or you're with. Then you now give the person one heavy, you know, heavy question. And when the person begins to stammer, you say, hey, I've got you. So Jesus speaks and tells God, you know, love the Lord your God. The guy now said, all this I have done from my youth up. And he just said, oh, really? <laughs> okay. So you want to show that you are justified, that you are holy. <laughs> Good. So ah, no problem now. This is what you want to do. You really want to really have standing with God? Good. Go and sell all that you have. Everything, not some. Don't give tithes. Don't give first fruits. Take all that you have, sell it. Don't take it to the temple or give it to the Pharisees where they can hear you and say, wow, wonderful man. Mm-mm. He said, go and share it to the poor. I said, huh? As you what? In our, Jesus did not now stop there. Jesus said, after you have shared it to the poor, you have start following me. Uh-uh. As you, me, rich man, it's like this. Let me explain what Jesus is saying. A guy drives him so that I want to paint the picture so you will get it. A guy drives in to a service that Jesus was having with a Range Rover Evo Quay. All right? 2024 model. Amen? He now drives into the service, you know, smelling good, enters the service, goes to meet Jesus, and Jesus is talking, and he's like, you know, him too is forming that, you know, we are both enlightened, you know, you read, I read, you know. And Jesus is talking and he's saying, yeah, yeah, excuse me, wonderful sermon, wonderful homily. Priest Jesus. All right. What was I do to enter eternal life? And Jesus said, Oh, you know, love the Lord, you know, and love him. I said, Oh, yeah, I've done that since I was good, you know, this. And Jesus says, All right. You have a net worth of $1.5 billion and you came with a Range Rover Evoque. All right. So this is what I want you to do. You see, they take that Range Rover Evoque and give that beggar guy there that really has not, you know, in your own mind doesn't deserve it. Just hand him the keys. That's not all. He said, $1.3 billion. I want you to take every single one of it and look at the poor in Jerusalem and distribute it until you have zero dollars. Now, make your life existence about following me. So you will come and sit down in this temple and you'll be taking notes all your life. I said, ah, nah. I pass. The Bible says the guy turned away sorrowful for he had many possessions. Guess what? That guy just broke the first law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your might. Because the Lord thy God was Jesus. And the Lord thy God was saying to choose him over material things. And he couldn't choose the Lord thy God. So obviously, he was not keeping the law. Are you following what I'm saying? So you use the law. It's the same thing when they came to Jesus and they were talking about adultery and you know, sexual sins and all that. You know? And the guy, said, I have, you know, the guy comes and says, I have not committed adultery with anybody. I have not killed anybody. And Jesus said, hey, you ah, chill. If you look upon a woman to lust after her, you have committed adultery with her in your heart. Eh? What do you, in my, so we are counting hearts now. Jesus says yes. So basically what Jesus is saying is, when God says thou shalt not commit adultery, in Exodus chapter 20, it included, it was not just physical adultery he's talking about, He's talking about adultery where? In the heart. And we all know that's hard. I'm sorry, a lot of sisters will say, no, we will not. That's for the guys. Yo, come on, you get out of here. You're watching K- K- M- K- M- uh, Korea Wood. We know why you're watching Korea Wood. I mean, what they call that? K Wood. K drama. Mm. With those fine boys, with those nice dresses they wear. I told my wife one time, I said, baby, hmm. Because my wife loves Korea wood. <laughs> K-drama. She loves it. 
Oh my God, I know she's going to be angry as she's watching now. She loves it. When I come in, she, she can just, you know, after she prays a lot, but when she wants to relax, Kay Wood, she's watching it on Netflix and she's watching the, these guys don't do eight episodes or six. They do like 34. <laughs> and so she's watching and watching. I'm like, babe, I, you know, I'm like, hmm, baby, these, these guys are handsome, man. <laughs> handsome, no pimple anywhere in sight. No skin conditions, nothing. The fresher than the freshest tomatoes. Babe, the Lord thy God said, Thou shalt not commit adultery, <laughs> even in your heart. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you see, ladies say they like K drama for the conversations. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's why you notice, little sisters now, they want you to treat. So when they say some Christian guys are not, they, are, they want that, that K drama guy, you know, that K drama that does come, well dressed, perfume, looking good, leather jacket, nice chiffon dress, looking good, always well made up, never looking unruly. Praise God. Anton, you know, you know there's, a way, <laughs> there's a way we talk. He will wait, then the, the way he does bring the camera. And his hair will just fly up and come down. Ah. <laughs> so Jesus goes and takes the law of Moses and says, in your heart. Woo! Then Jesus says, it's not until you kill someone that you've murdered them. If you hate them, you've killed them. That's how to use the law. So when you meet a self-righteous person that says he doesn't need a savior, all you need to do is invoke Moses. <laughs> because that is the purpose of the law of Moses. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So, when you see, when you preach the gospel, the person says he doesn't need it. Preach Moses. By the time you are done with Moses, <laughs> please bring that Jesus. I beg. I want it. He's like, I need him. Yes. Praise God. I said, praise God. Right. So, the purpose of the law of Moses was to reveal sin. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter number 5. Hmm. Was to reveal sin. If you want to know what sin is, read Moses. So when you read Leviticus and you read Numbers and you read Exodus, you now begin to understand what sin is. Sin is any conduct, thought, or action, praise God, that defiles God's temple. That is what sin is. Anything that defiles God's temple. Anything that is not in accordance with what God wants done in his temple is sin. That's what sin is. Praise God. Romans 5.20. Can we read? What does it say? Romans chapter 5 and verse 20 says what? Moreover, the law entered that the what? Offense may... Talk to me. The law entered that the offense may... So the purpose of the law was to ensure that the offense will abound. Okay, how many of you were class captains when you were in primary school or secondary school? So you notice, when there was no law, people were making noise in class. Then you will not come. Anybody that makes noise now, your name will enter the names of what? Noise makers. So what is going on now is that you now want to impute the law so that when they make noise, their name enters the book so that you cannot bring punishment. Are you following? That was the purpose of the law. Because before the law, there was sin in the world. But sin was not imputed because there was no law. Hallelujah. If, now, <laughs> if you're driving on the road... Has anybody here maybe last mass caught you for turning where you should not have turned? I'll, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> Glory to God. The purpose of law was reveal sin. So one day, I was driving somewhere. Ba, ba, ba. So I wanted to turn to the other side. So I got there, and I turned to the other side. A policeman just jumped. You turned. I said, what happened? He said, you turned. You will take us to a station. And I said, why? I didn't break any law. The person said, in this place, we don't turn. Hmm. 
I said, okay, we don't turn here. Okay, but I turned because I didn't know we couldn't turn here. The guy said, you argue with me? Let's go to the station. I said, no problem. And I was like, um, he will come and take my car. I said, no, you cannot sit down here. It's my car. Enter. Let's go to the station. He said, I will confiscate your car. So I said, is it me you want to be Bugami? <laughs> now, Lagos boy, you. Let's go. We got there. It was this, uh, is it Aguda police station? I was on see, but it's still Asia. We got there, entered, and the, uh, the, what do you call them? DPO that was there, well educated guy, and he was a lawyer. So I said, Mr. DPO, how are you doing today? He said, I'm fine. General, ah. He said, what did this gentleman do? He said, I turned where I'm not supposed to turn. I said, Mr. DPO, I cannot be said to have broken a traffic law when there was no sign that said it was an offense to break it. So I said, there was no sign on the road that said turning to the other side here was forbidden. And I took photographs before they changed it. I said, this is the place. Check. There is no sign there. Then the, law, the DPO said, officer, is there a sign there? He said, eh, there was a sign there last week, but uh, some of these people, they remove her now. They remove her now. He said, officer, is there a sign there? He said, no. The man turned to me and said, doctor, we're so sorry to have wasted your time. All right, you are free to go. We will ensure that that sign is put back there so that anyone who is law-abiding and sees it will not break the law. Now, most police officers you will meet on your day-to-day -day are not going to be as learned as that DPO, but that guy was learned. And that was it. Because where there is no law, there is no sin. It does not mean that sin is not being... But if the, the law is not there, you cannot hold anyone responsible for sin. So the introduction of the law of Moses had one purpose, so that God can hold men for their sins, and they will be found guilty for their sins, and they will say, we need a savior. So the end of the law, the goal of the law is to bring men to the end of themselves and to cry out for Jesus. Praise God. It's like this. How many of you know a stubborn person? A gra, -gra person? That you try using love for the person, but it does not work. <laughs> amen. Amen. I said amen. amen. Okay, let me give you an example. Praise God. Imagine somebody. You always want them. Stop speeding. Stop speeding. Stop speeding. Say no! I, 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 oh. So the person one day borrowed their friend's car. You've used love. You send videos about not speeding. You've sent all those things. You've called elders to talk to the person. Don't speed. You know, everybody has you even called Sandri, San, um, um, Sandra to do shrink uh, therapist to ask, is there a reason why you speed? Is there an inner emotional turmoil behind your speeding? You paid for the therapy session because Sandra is not free. Praise God. And the person still was speeding. So one day, they took their friend's Bugatti. Bugatti Veyron. All right? I said, today they will hear. Today, he told Fred, don't worry. Just, I want to take it out for a cruise. And that person said, no problem. Be careful, oh. Mm. He didn't hear a word. So he went there. Beep, beep, and he drove and drove and drove. Miscalculated the brake because he has not used the car before. Because this car, the brake is button. It's not, you understand? Hmm. So he pressed the brake, the thing, then, pa. He broke the front light. He brought the car back to his friend. And the friend said, ha, you broke the front light? That light alone is two million naira. He rushes to his parents, please help me. It's two million. The guy says, no, now you will face the consequences of your action. That's the purpose of the law. To bring men to the end of themselves. So that they will say, God, we have heads. Now tell us what to do with our life. Because before the law, we, 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 we know it. We know it. But after the law, and you have seen the shege, that sin we cause. You know what I say? 
I know my redeemer. At least exactly. So God wanted to bring men to the point where they will cry for a redeemer before he shows up. You will ask yourself a question. Why didn't Christ show up immediately Adam sinned? God had to wait for man to discover that he needed what? A savior. Because if you check, even after Adam sinned, did he ask for help? No. He didn't. He was defending himself. And all true, people kept defending themselves, defending themselves, defending themselves, defending themselves. But the purpose of the Lord was for men to come to the end of themselves so that when the Savior comes, they will now say, ah, no more sacrifices for sin anymore. We have received the end of the law. Are you following what I'm saying? The purpose of the law. So the purpose of the law was to reveal sin. Look at Romans 5, 13 to 15. So when you are reading the law of Moses, that's what you are reading. You are reading the revelation of sin. Praise God. Romans 5, 13 to 15. So that's why you see a lot of, if the man forces himself off a wo- on a woman, kill him. Do you know why that death, why do you, see the, do you see why there's a lot of death in the law of Moses? The purpose of the death in the law, but the sentence of death in the law of Moses was for you to see that the wages of sin is what? Is death. That's what he's showing you. That the consequence of sinful action is death. That's what the law shows you. Praise God. I said, praise God. Yeah. And the law of Moses had, all right, the justice of God. An eye for an eye. What an eye for an eye says is fear treatment. It's not saying that if you pluck someone's eye, I'll pluck your eye. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that the crime must fit the punishment. Are you following what I'm saying? So, for example, you have a scenario where it says, if a man sleeps with a woman who's a virgin, he now says that that man must marry that woman. The only condition where he doesn't marry that woman is if the father of the woman says no. And if he doesn't, if the man says no, that guy is still supposed to pay bright, bright price and honor the lady. So you now begin to find that in the law of Moses, God wanted women to be honored and respected by men. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yeah, honored and respected by men. God wanted responsibility on the part of the men to women. So he didn't just sleep with a woman and walk away. How? Just like that? No. Mm-mm. No. By the law of Moses, you will marry her. Because sex is supposed to be inside what? Marriage. Praise God. So the law was not evil. It only had a purpose which did not involve justification in the sight of God. But it had a purpose. The purpose was to bring you to the end of yourself and crying out for a savior. Let's keep reading. Romans chapter 5 and verse 13. Can we read one, two, go? He says, For unto the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Verse 14, can we read one, two, go? It says what? <laughs> Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned at the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Verse 15 now says what? But not as the offense also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one man be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, are abounded unto many. Praise God. Galatians 3 and verse 18 to 19. Let us also read. Glory to God. I said glory to God. He said, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. 19, everybody read. One to go. He says what? Now, no. Wherefore then, serve the law. What's the purpose of the law? It was added because of? Till the what? Seed should come to whom the promise was made. Now, notice what it says. The law was added. So that means the law of Moses was not in God's original plan. It was added because of transgression. And it was temporary because it was added or given till someone showed up. All right? Till, look at it. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. That seed is Christ. So the law of Moses was given until Christ showed up. Are you following that? So the law of Moses was time bound. Was given by God, but it was what? Time bound. Say it was time bound. Time bound. Praise God. Praise God. All right. It was time bound. 
Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. Look at Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. Romans 10 verse 4. So, you now see, it says here, For Christ is the end of the law, which agrees with Romans chapter 5, 13 to 15. It says, Christ is the end. The word end there is completion, conclusion, or fulfillment. Christ is the fulfillment of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So that means what the law was trying to achieve, the man, what the law was trying to achieve in the Old Testament, for the man who has believed, the law has achieved it, or it is achieved in the man who has believed in Jesus Christ. Remember, Christ is the end game of the law. The law was to bring men toward to Christ. So when a man comes to Christ, the goal of the law has been fulfilled where in him. Are you following what I'm saying? Let me show you that. Look at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and 24. Are you learning something this evening? Are you glad you came? Uh huh. Galatians 3 24. Now look at what it says about the law. It says, Wherefore the law was our what? Come on, read. The law was our what? To do what? Are you seeing that? The law was our schoolmaster to bring us. That's the goal of the law. To bring us to Christ. So when you are preaching the gospel to somebody, and say, God loves you. <laughs> Doesn't get good. Go to the law. Hallelujah. Do you know that? Oh, you also, do you know that in the sight of God, God is holy. All your sins without Jesus Christ will count against you. Ah, I'm a good person. I'm not fornicated. Ah, no, no. But have you, have you lost it after a man in your heart? Have you looked at whiskey and said, I wish you would be mine? You understand? You have, haven't you? It's a sin before God. <laughs> Praise God. You say, but I just had, it's just a thought. Yes, it's a sin. Glory to God. It's a sin. The Bible says that anyone that knows the good to do and does not do it is sin. It says, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's property. Have you seen your neighbor's iPhone 15 and began to covet it? That's sin. Hallelujah. And you said, I wish I could have it. Praise God. Have you coveted your, na- your neighbor's look? It's, not your, it's part of your neighbor's property. You have seen your neighbor person has big shirts and you're like, hmm, I wish I could have that. It's a sin. Praise God. Covetousness is a sin. Ah, I'm a sinner. Good. Thank God Jesus Christ has paid the sacrifice for all your sins. So you have come to Jesus so that all your sins, of which there are many, <laughs> are you getting it? Exactly. That's what the law does. The law shows to you that you have many sins so that you reach out to the Savior to save you from the sin. Because without the law, the pride of men will be intact. You'll be proud against God. You remember that rich, the rich fool? Yeah, you'll be proud. Because the natural disposition of man is to be arrogant. <laughs> Amen. I've seen this thing several times. Just let a man have some few change. That's when you understand the difference between pride and arrogance. <laughs> pride is of the heart. A poor man can be proud. Because in his heart... <laughs> A poor man cannot be arrogant. An arrogant poor man is badly behaved. <laughs> He's badly behaved. Do you understand? Because that's how people look at him. Why are you badly behaved? Because he's poor. But let him have money. Arrogance. That is the default position of the natural man. Arrogance towards God. I am better than others now. Uh-uh. 
What is it? I just impregnated your friends. Am I like, I'm better than others that impregnated your friend and your, your sister. And you understand? That is the natural disposition of man. Arrogance. But you see what the Lord does is the Lord will bring him. Remember David? I'm afraid of David's story. Do you notice that David did what he did? And until God shows up, nothing was wrong. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? That's the, you see, that's the natural disposition of man. When he has power and wealth. You understand? He has power and wealth. If you talk to him anyhow, you say, you talk to me? Me? You talk to me? Do you know, you, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? Praise God. Do you know? That's the natural disposition of man. The man without Christ. Praise God. So that the law, all right, shows man who he is. It's a mirror. So when you study the law properly, you will say, I need a savior. Proper study of the law shows you that you need a savior. The proper study of the law shows you that without Christ, you are guilty before God. Praise God. So the, the law has a use today. And it is to show the man who does not see himself as a sinner, who he really is. He's a sinner. So he says, the law is, was our schoolmaster to bring us unto what? Christ, that we might be what? Justified by faith. Now, look at that word schoolmaster. The word schoolmaster is the Greek word peda, peda gogos, peda, where we get pediatrics from, peda, that is P-A-I-D-A, gogos. Now, what does peda gogos mean? Peda gogos means a tutor, a guide. Let me just give you something about some history. Um, there was a particular king called Alexander the Great. How many of you know Alexander the Great? Right? Ah, uh, you don't know Alexander the Great. Okay, you know Alexander the Great. Okay, I'm I'm glad. Amen. All right, Alexander the Great had a pedagogos, a tutor called Aristotle. Aristotle was Alexander the Great's pedagogos. All right, what Aristotle's job was was to train Alexander from when he was a boy to when he became a man. So that was the job of the pedagogos. So what Paul was doing was he was borrowing a term that was known in Greek society. Praise God. All right. And saying, listen, the law was our tutor, our pedagogos, that was training us when we were children. All right. Until we became men. So that when we became men, we no longer needed the law. So what he's saying is God gave the law until Christ showed up. Now that Christ has showed up, there has been an handshake between the law and what? Christ. Christ goes, you've done your job, I will take it from here. Do you understand? Do you understand? Exactly, that is it. So, we are no longer under the tutorship of the law of Moses. Because Christ has showed up. Christ has showed up to show us in fullness what the law of Moses was about. So the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. Look at Galatians chapter 3 and 23. This is good teaching, oh, amen. Amen. Good teaching. Good teaching. It was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. So you don't go and tell somebody who is in Christ and say things like, a, a woman must not wear that which pertained to a man. That you shouldn't wear trousers. You understand what I'm talking about? All right? You don't, you don't do that because this person is not under the law. Hallelujah. What you tell that person is to allow the Spirit of God on their inside to regulate their dressing. Praise God. That's what you tell them. You talk about you appeal to the indwelling Spirit on their inside because the indwelling Spirit on their inside self-regulates and shows and determines to them what is modest and what is immodest. Are you following what I'm saying? Praise God. So, basically, now in Christ, we tell them to listen to their recreated human spirit, all right, in terms of how they dress, how they talk, how they relate with people. We don't need to point them to the law of Moses. No, they, 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 they don't need the law of Moses because the intent of the law of Moses has been fulfilled in them because the Holy Ghost now lives where? In them. Praise God. 
So this is why whenever you find someone who says they are a Christian and you present that appeal to them based on the spirit of the law and based on what is expected of a believer in the earth of the spirit and they don't take heed or they are repulsed by your approach, you must question whether or not the spirit of God is where in them. Are you following what I'm saying? Yeah, you have to question it. Because, for example, if a lady says she's born again and she's sleeping with a married man and you now bring it up and she's now cursing you and, you know, fighting you and even does the life, a life stream. If I'm sleeping with a married man, what is now your concern? You know, we have to now question whether the spirit of God we are. Is it? Because if I come in the name of the Lord trying to awaken your conscience and try to get you to listen to the Spirit of God on your inside, if there is no Spirit of God at home, are you following what I'm saying? Uh-huh, yes. Because if the Spirit of God is at home, then the Spirit of God will walk with my words to convict you and say, ah, it's true. Praise God. Many times the problem is we are assuming certain people are saved and have the Spirit of God, but they actually don't. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Galatians 3.23 says, But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Everybody say, before faith came. He says, before faith came, we were kept under the law. Shut up unto the faith, unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. So the moment faith came, we were no longer under the law. Praise God. The law was given for a time. Galatians 4, 1 to 5, as we round up. Galatians 4, 1 to 5, as we round up. Look at what he says. Galatians 4, 1 to 5, as we round up. Now I say that the heir, remember what we said about um, Alexander the Great? You know, sometimes you, because the, there's a Greek subtext to many of these scriptural writings, because there's New Testament written in Greek, sometimes we have to reveal and appeal to that culture for you to understand what is being said. So it says, now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, different nothing from a servant, correct? Though he be Lord of all, right? It says, but he's under what? Tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. So the, until the time appointed of the father. So, so even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Verse 4, can we read? But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Verse 5. It says what? To redeem them that were what? Are you seeing that? So, listen. The, we were under the law. Under the law. The law was our tutor and governor. Praise God. Then Christ comes and redeems us. He takes us out of the laws. You understand? He takes us away from the law. So, the law was to be present until the Redeemer showed up. Praise God. You understand? So, the law was to be present until the Redeemer showed up. The law even made it easy for us to recognize who the Redeemer is. So, from the law, we recognize the Redeemer. So, when we recognize, oh, the law has testified of the Redeemer, when the Redeemer shows up, we are to hand ourselves over to the Redeemer, and the Redeemer takes us into the promised land. Hallelujah. The law cannot take us into the promised land. It is the Redeemer that will take us into the promised land. What the law does is helps us recognize the Redeemer. The law helps us recognize the Savior. The law helps us understand that by ourselves we cannot enter the promised land. We need help. And that help is only going to come to one person who is the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And when he comes, we have to give ourselves to him. Are you following that? Praise the Lord. I said praise the Lord. Yes. So, the righteousness of the law does not justify. It was never intended to do so. The right, righteousness always was to be by faith in Jesus Christ. Always. The law was a shadow, or is a shadow of things to come. So, that means the law typified and foreshadowed Jesus Christ. Now that Jesus Christ is come, we are no longer under the law of Moses. Praise God. Praise God. But... Because the things written in the law were a shadow of things to come, and it had responsibilities. And for example, it had the responsibility of giving in the law of Moses. It had the responsibility of prayer in the law of Moses. It had the responsibility of um, 
of reaching the world. Love Moses. He had the responsibility of keeping yourself holy. Love Moses. It was a shadow of things to come. So we must now see the substance now in the shadow that was in the law. Are you following? So they gave under the law of Moses. We are to give now that we are in Christ. Are you following? We are to look beyond all those different laws. The motive is giving. Praise God. So that's why you even notice that under the law of Moses, or in the dispensation of the law, we find that people actually gave generously. In the wilderness, the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, they gave generously to build the tabernacle. So one of the things you learn and you see in the dispensation of the law, all right, were certain attributes that were New, New Testamental. So, for example, they wanted a t- the tabernacle of Moses. And the Bible lets us understand that the whole nation gave, gave, until Moses said they should stop giving. So we now begin to see that where giving is concerned, new creations are supposed to give until the need, the corporate need is met. That is generosity in giving. Praise God. We see the same thing with David. When they wanted to build the temple of Solomon, you find that David, even though he was not going to see the temple, David gave something around $30 billion in today's money, all right, as his contribution to Solomon's temple. That's what David did. Generosity, you see it. Solomon wanted to sacrifice, all right, to God. He was also supposed to sacrifice. What was he required to do? He was just one man. He was just, you know, one ifa, one lamb that was supposed to bring. Solomon showed up and sacrificed a thousand lamb offerings. Generosity. So you see that in the law. Praise God. You see that in the law. Praise the Lord. You see that in law. So you see those things that are typological take on substance in the New Testament. Amen. So in the New Testament, just like in law, Moses were told to take the territories God had given them, all right? In the New Testament, we are going to go about preaching, make disciples of all nations, all right? In the Old Testament, we are told to give first fruit, told to give tithes and all that, all right? In the New Testament, we are supposed to give as we have purposed in our heart generously for God loves a cheerful giver praise God in the honor law of Moses we are told to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our strength and love our neighbors as ourselves in New Testament we are told to walk in the spirit and we shall not what fulfill the loss of the flesh it says that if any man walk in the spirit he has fulfilled the law of, of Moses praise the Lord so you see that so in the Old Testament, it's a typology. In the New Testament, we have uh, substance. Praise God. So the law of Moses had a purpose, and it was to bring us unto Christ. When the Old Testament scriptures are properly read, it will lead to one question. Where is Christ that I may accept him? That's what happened when the Utopia eunuch was reading the book of Isaiah. He turned to Philip and said, was this prophet talking about himself or what? Another. And the Bible says about Philip. It says, and beginning at that same scripture, he preached Christ unto him. Because that is the purpose of the Old Testament. To reveal Jesus Christ. So let no one speak down on the Old Testament. Let no one speak down on the Old Testament prophets. They are the mouthpiece of God that revealed Christ in their prophecies and in their typologies. Anyone that can see that is actually unlearned. And like Peter said, rests the scriptures. Glory to God. Glory to God. Have we learned something today? Have you been blessed? I said, have you been blessed? All right, can we just lift up our hands and thank God for what we've learned? Praise God, praise God, hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. Ah, glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you for listening. We are sure that you have been blessed. For more messages, kindly search for our Telegram channel using the link t. M-E slash Oikia Sisi. God has blessed you.